Yeah. I always forget the mic, so you can help remind me. Do I need to turn it on when I do the Yeah, no, turn it on. Okay. Is, is it on? Yeah, I don't mind yelling. Well, I'll, I'll just move this. Okay? Okay. So they, they may not even have that hooked up, but it, it looks like it is. Okay. Good evening. The San Dimas City Council meeting for April the 11th uh, will come to order. Tonight we're, uh, we're privileged to have students from San Dimas High School. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the mayor, uh, who's taken my spot for the evening, uh, Cora, will introduce herself and then she'll ask you to join her in the pledge. Hi, I'm Cora Averwig. I'm a senior at San Dimas High School, and if I could have you all stand up to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, ready? Begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United, States, United States of America, of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight is one of those rare opportunities that we'll have to have the city clerk uh, read the, the roll call of the city councilman pre uh, present. Mayor Badar. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ebner. Here. Councilmember Nakano. Present. Councilmember Vienna. He's right present. On. Councilmember Weber? Here. Let the record reflect that all members are yeah, present. Councilman Vienna is away out of, the, out of the state, but he's joining us by uh, Zoom. And um, so he happens to be in Maryland. So we're, he, he'll be listening in and he'll be responding to things via the Zoom. Okay. Mr. Mayor, if I can just point out, I do have one member of the public uh, present with me as well uh, in the location, attending the meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought the ghosts were talking to me. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, that's good. Uh, he looked more relaxed than you do. <laughs> All right. T tonight is uh, our student in government night, and uh, Latoya, our staff member, will give us a presentation. Good evening, Mayor, Mayors, City Council. I'd like to introduce our government teacher from San Dimas High School, Dave Milbrandt. He'll give a brief overview and introduce the students that are here with us this evening. Thank you very much, LaToya, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, and my students. Uh, we are privileged and pleased to be here this evening to celebrate and to participate in Students in Government Day. This is a project, according to my records, has been going on for more than 40 years uh, via San Dimas High School and the City of San Dimas. Uh, typically, it's a City Council meeting in the evening, plus a day long of activities the next day where we learn about how city problems are fixed and addressed. Here, um, LaToya and her team have done a wonderful job preparing and presenting things here. We have students that have fun and enjoy this program every year. And some years they even get so engaged they want to get involved in doing things to help cities or municip municipalities down the road. And it's a very wonderful thing to see. I think we even had one member of our school got into city government directly because of his experience with Students in Government Day many years ago. So let's introduce our team tonight that we have here. Uh, Cora Averwick is our uh, mayor for the evening here. Um, Isabel Trejos is going to be our Mayor Pro Tem, hanging out with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ebner over there. Uh, Sam Roark is with Mr. Nakano over there, okay. And we'll go over to, uh, with Mr. Weber is Bosman Porter. Bos over there here. Cool, that's our four members of the council that are up here tonight. We also have Jared Marcelino, who is here. Please, Jared, where'd you go to? There you go, and back there. Cool, very good, excellent here. We have uh, Scarlett Munoz here is with our city manager over there. Great, with Chris Constantine. Monica Pastor here with our city attorney over here with Jeff, which is excellent. Uh, Caden Spouts is right there in the audience back there. There's Caden's very cool, excellent here with Administrative Services, I think, tonight. Director of Public Works, Nathan Gantana is hanging out with our, 
A public works with Sherry. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Good to see. Mark Cooley is hanging out uh, with uh, Brad McKinney, Assistant City Manager. Excellent. That was exciting. And Sarah Vega, the Director of Parks and Recreation here. Our team's a little bit smaller than usual before, but we have a team of passionate people that are going to do a great job. And we're looking forward to tonight and to tomorrow as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council and staff for allowing us to be part of this privilege every year. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for allowing us. Other recognitions for t this evening is, uh, and we won't go, go through reading the proclamations, but we have a proclamation for Earthquake Preparedness Month as well as Autism Awareness Month. But since there's no representative of those groups here, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to move forward. We have a presentation tonight from Waste Management. Um, they, they, they actually gave us some little trash cans in case you need to use it. <laughs> hey, Waste Management is those. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Lauren Marshall. I'm the Senior Management Analyst with the Public Works Department. And um, we're basically going to give you a very brief overview of what SB 1383 is before we launch into the Smart Truck presentation. So what is SB 1383? Uh, it is the most significant waste reduction mandate in the last 30 years. Um, it was effective January 1st, 2022. Um, it is a statewide effort to reduce emissions of short-lived climate pollutants. Say that three times fast. Um, it is uh, basically greenhouse gas reduction. Um, by 2025, this law aims to reduce the amount of green waste. Um, so think when, uh, yard clippings, um, food waste that will be disposed in landfills. We'll want to divert that by 75%. Um, also by 2025, we'd like to rescue at least 20% of edible food that is currently being disposed of um, and instead have that for human consumption. This law expands upon the requirements um, of prior legislation that mostly pertain to businesses before. So we've required businesses to recycle, um, not just cardboard, uh, glass, aluminum, et cetera, but also organics as well. So now the difference with SB 1383 is that this is going to apply to everyone in the state of California. So if you have not heard about it, uh, Jonathan, could we skip next? All right. So here's what we know. One in five children go hungry every night in the state of California. Uh, redirecting perfectly edible food that is currently being disposed to feed those in need can help alleviate this. For every two and a half tons of food rescued, that's the equivalent of taking one car off the road for a year. Recovering one ton of edible food could provide more than 1,600 meals to hungry people. So countywide, LA County, it is estimated that over 1.6 million tons of food was sent to landfills in 2020. This represents about 15% of all disposal going to landfills. Diverting 25% of this wasted food in LA County from landfills annually is equivalent to removing pollution that would be generated by 52,000 cars per year. Um, so while this goal may seem big, um, each one of us does have the power to help achieve this goal. Another reason for 1383 is we know we're experiencing a climate crisis. Uh, Record-breaking temperatures, longer fire seasons, extreme droughts, or the opposite as we saw this past winter, um, as well as rising sea levels. So these extreme weather events are par partly caused by too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so named because they trap the sun's heat and warm the planet. Scientists have found that organic waste dumped in traditional landfills decomposes and creates this methane, um, which actually exceeds the potency of carbon dioxide that's produced by cars. Uh, to slow the advance of global warming, the state wants to redirect this organic material to composting centers where it can help sink carbon back into the earth through mulch, compost, or um, refuse-derived fuel. Um, and that would power things, say, like trash trucks. Um, so food waste can be diverted to clean energy, um, but when organic materials such as food scraps and paper products break down in the landfill, they produce that methane in our atmosphere. 
So reducing this gas now through the actions like organic waste recycling will significantly reduce emissions and will reduce the impacts of climate change in our lifetime. The city and waste management have provided outreach and education uh, since 2020 um, on this new law and its many components and continue to do so by utilizing social media, the city um, and waste management websites, uh, the Frontier Recreation Brochure, flyers, print newsletters, and attending community meetings. It is our intention to ensure the community has the tools necessary to meet the requirements of this legislation, but the state also requires the city and waste management to enforce this law uh, to ensure citywide compliance. So tonight, I would like to introduce you to one of the city's waste management representatives, Lily Quiroa, and she's going to be explaining how smart truck technology will help us not only accomplish the enforcement requirement, but also perpetuate that outreach and education. Lily? Sorry, I'm getting instructions. I'm probably still not gonna do well. Uh, well, good evening, my name is Lily Kiroa and I am the Area Regional Manager for Waste Management. Um, thank you for the opportunity for being here and I will be talking more about the mechanics of this law. Um, Lauren mentioned the goal of the law, which is really to push towards 75% diversion. If you wanna envision that, you can picture your little trash card that you and you know what you have at home and 75% of what you throw in that trash cart by this law you need to now put it in either your recycling card or your organic card that is how um, those are the big goals that California has for all of our cities so with that I'm gonna go and move into our smart truck and before I do that let me just say smart truck is not a new technology we we've been using smart truck in all of our cities on the commercial side for the past few years we've been really focusing on the commercial sector to comply with these state recycling regulations and the smart truck um, technology we've been using like I mentioned in our commercial to assist to make sure that we're capturing our commercial um, customers to be correctly putting the recycling material in the recycling bin and not use that you know recycling bin as an extra trash cart so the technology is not new we've been doing it for a few years what is new is how we're going to be using this technology to support the provisions that I'll outline right now with SB 1383 and the focus is now shifting on the residential side so with that um, our smart track technology will be supporting um, a provision of cart contamination monitoring that is a um, aspect that the law is asking um, the haulers the cities to do is literally looking at the residents cards to make sure that they're recycling properly as I move on I'll talk a little bit more detail of how we're going to do that the other provision that um, our smart truck is going to support is education not only are we going to be doing this cart contamination but if we find contamination there's going to be a process of education material that will be sent to the customer so it's an opportunity to teach the customer to recycle correctly um, also the education will also help us as we do this um, smart truck using going out with our trucks and monitoring the carts we'll be able to identify the routes that are probably a little bit more dirtier or the residents on this route are not recycling properly so the beauty of, of, of this data collection that we'll have through our smart truck technology is that we will be able to identify particular routes that may need a little bit more work and we can have targeted education campaigns meaning that this particular route will be able to send additional communication pieces to improve and we'll be able to monitor if if those education materials are being successful by the amount of recycling that's getting picked up or seeing if the material is cleaner um, and last is reporting this regulation comes with a laundry list of reporting the data the information that we'll be collecting through our smart track technology meaning what routes have we reviewed how many carts did we review how many notices went out to the customers 
how many enforcements we did with customers, all those details we'll be able to collect and then be able to give it to the city so the city can then share with Cal Recycle. Let's dive a little deeper into smart truck technology. As mentioned, we will be using this technology to leverage all the different provisions that this law is mandating. And truthfully, um, it's something that is gonna help the community a lot through an education perspective. The trucks are gonna be equipped with three cameras. We have a white shot, meaning that the camera will take footage of the home that's getting service. Then there's a second camera that's going to take video footage of the actual cart, so the actual cart's getting picked up. And then there's a third camera that's actually gonna take footage of the material actually getting dropped into what we call the hopper, which is where material goes, and there'll be a clear view of that material. So that is the smart track technology. Then we move into what do we do with all that video footage? We have actually trained team that will be looking at that footage, and if they do see that there's been large amounts of contamination, like real contamination. I'm not talking about one plastic bag or one, um, I don't know, bad thing placed in the card. We're talking about a serious contamination. Then what they do is that they will capture that screenshot of that contaminated items and then they will create a letter. The letter will not only have a picture of the item that got you know, seen as not being correctly put in the right card, but also they would have a link to the video. And then they will inform the customer that, you know, on this date, on this time, we saw, we serviced your home and we found your recycling card. You did not do a good job managing the material or your organic card got caught with a lot of trash. And then the customer will be able to go click on that link and actually see their material being thrown in the trash. In addition to the letter, the letter will also come with education material saying, here's some helpful tips how you can improve your recycling practices. So again, it's reinforcing education and an improvement in recycling practices. Um, let me move to the next slide. I'm actually gonna show you this video. This is what we call the hopper. It's the inside of our truck. You will see the top of a recycling card, and we know that it's a recycling card because it's a blue lid. And this is what a technician will see. So you see the blue card, and why I caught this is because there are two big, large plastic bags. So this person, but well, that's one of the education aspects that we want our residents to understand is that we need them to put their recyclables on bag, meaning it's okay to use bags in your kitchen and your home and everything, but once you take it to the recycling card, just dump it loose, loosely the materials in the recycling card or in the organics. Don't tie it and make it, you know, tight like this, like a bag, because what it looks like, it could be trash. Um, it's very difficult for our workers at the recycling plant to be constantly opening bags because nine times out of 10 in our experience, it's a trash bag, it's full of trash and then that trash fully contaminates the rest of the recycling material. So this is just a sample of what a technician would see. So we would capture and then we would send a letter. There's other pictures that we took of what we would basically tag as a contaminated card or an overloaded card. And again, this customer would get a letter informing them of the incident. They will see a clear picture of the reason that they got tagged. In St. Dimas, we are going to have what we call three strikes in your eye, which means that you have two chances. If you get one letter, it's just like a, hey, Let's improve our recycling practices. Um, if this continues, we may look at a contamination um, fees. 
If they get a second incident, again, another reminder how to do things correctly. But if this behavior continues, you may be facing a contamination fee. Then the third and subsequent incidents, there's a contamination fee of about $20 that will be posed. And again, let me emphasize, this is being done because CalRecycle really wants the state cities to move to a higher diversion. I mean, Laura mentioned the 75%. So that is really why we need to do this because we need to improve our diversion in the city. Um, every year, the city needs to provide with CalRecycle what we call a diversion report. And that's when we tell them this is how much trash San Dimas threw in their landfill. This is how many tons were put in the recycling. And the recycling tons have to increase. And that's really the goal that CalRecycle has for this regulation in all their cities. How are we going to start this? We understand that this is a new program. We understand that this is new to our residential communities. We are kicking off what we call a 60-day education campaign. Every resident will receive this flyer that basically will explain to them, again, what SB 1383 mandates are and what is contamination. And then we'll also introduce the Smart Truck program. And we will explain to them that starting in May, we will have 60 days where it's going to be all education. It's an education blitz. Within those 60 days, if a customer receives a notice, it will be purely education. It's not going to count towards their incidents. It's just, hey, let's improve recycling. Stop this behavior. If this behavior continues, you may be getting more of these incidents. So for 60 days, it's an education blitz that will work with staff to do social media. Like I said, a flyer will be going to people's homes. We'll send reminders in the bill inserts. And again, it's a 60 day of awareness of not only this law, but also the program. And then starting July 1st, this program officially starts. Um, again, this program, you know, we're not in the business of what I say being the trash cops. That's not what we're here about. It's really to push education. We understand that there's going to be incidents. We understand that a customer might call and say, hey, I received this letter. Um, this is not even my trash. My neighbor is using my car. We get it. We get it. And we'll work with that customer. And again, if we get a call, it's an opportunity for an education. We'll waive those fees. You know, this is about really pushing education, really pushing better recycling practices. And this is not going to be a black and white program. We will be working with the city and you know, trying to work with the residents so they understand why we have to do this. And again, it's a new law that mandates this. So with that, I'm going to stay quiet. I don't know if you want to take questions. Questions? Yes. Is it on? OK. Um, I really want to commend you guys for this initiative to maintain accountability and increase diversion. Um, add a couple ideas. Yes. Um, a lot of the pollutants that we see are going to be from grocery stores and restaurants. So I was wondering if you could couple and like work with local restaurants and include these flyers in maybe like a takeout bag. I'm thinking a lot of these plastics are going to be from fast food places. So you could stick them in the bag so that people will see them with their food. And it's another reminder because I think it's really easy to see a flyer in the mail, read it, internalize it, and then move on with their day. But if they see it at the moment of... <laughs> contamination, I think it would really help as a reminder to move I forward. I think actually that's a really great idea um, because it would actually remind a consumer that that food that they're getting, if there's any leftovers that they're going to throw away, we're going to remind them to put it in the green bin. Not So we'll take that. We'll take notes on that. But thank you. I have one more thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think um, a good location for education is at the local San Dimas Farmers Market because I think there's going to be a, not only a lot of young people, I think young people care a lot about the environment and not saying that the older population doesn't, but I think that young people really have a passion for taking care of the environment. And so I think if you target that audience, they can help to educate their parents. And then also there's a lot of cult, cool 
elderly people at the farmer's market and <laughs> I think oh yeah <laughs> I think I think that would help a lot maybe just like a like a station um like like waste management An education do, like a little spinny wheel because that gets people going there um and to educate and maybe hand out those compost bins and I know the city that that in the city was handing out I think that's a great idea and I'm remiss um, not introducing Josh Goldman who is a new member of our team um, we're also growing a team specifically because we're going to be having to do a lot of outreach. Part of this program is also visiting HOAs, um, doing um, presentations at HOAs. We'll add farmers markets to the list. Um, we're already going to be attending city events, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think the success of this is really being people-to-people -people contact. So we are committed to being out in the community. Something like that. Anyone else? Have any I do have a couple of questions. Um, this, uh, I've, I've actually got three. Um, based on what uh, what you're showing us and, and talking about the auditors, looking at the videos from from each of the uh, trash trucks, obviously that would take a lot of manpower to to review everything. So, can you give us an idea of what kind of percentage of uh, videos are being reviewed by those auditors on on a particular uh, trash week? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so the route reviews annually, it's like once a year. So, um, and they're coming from different cities. We're doing about a 10% review of the footage mm -hmm. because um, that's <laughs> the best we can do considering everything that's happening with all the other cities. Yeah, it's definitely a lot. Yes. Um, and then can you talk about what happens uh, to the video and, and how long it's retained and, and yeah. when it's purged? Another great question. So per Cal Recycle, we need to maintain this data and for a year, at least a year. Um, so we, this videos, we will be uh, having them, the videos is gonna be about two years, but the data that we collect, the reports that we pull, will be forever. So we will always have access to those reports. There's a lot of uh, significant cost behind retaining video for two years, that's a long time. Um, and then I, I wanted to ask a question. This is more f out of my curiosity. Is the overfilled cart fee that was on page, uh, I guess, slide seven of your presentation, mm -hmm. is that new? Um, the reason I ask is there's the uh, middle photo there with the, the two carts. Mm -hmm. On any given trash day, every single house that I drive by has a can that looks like that, at least one of them. Uh, obviously, yeah. the one on the left there is pretty extreme as far as an overflow yeah. cart. I just wanted to, to know if... So the purpose of this one was not necessarily for the overflow. I mean, this would, we would not consider the middle okay. picture an overflow. It's more of like this trash-looking stuff that they didn't do a good job. This is what we would consider overflow, like extreme cases. I think we could probably agree on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is actually an actual customer. So <laughs> here. So this, this is extreme. So we're, again, the purpose for this is to provide education, increase recycling habits. It's not to be finding people left and right, but it really is an, it's an opportunity to educate our residents to do the right thing and put the material in the right carts. All right, thanks. That's all I've got. I just uh, appreciate the clarification. I think that probably makes some people feel a lot better. Yes. I had a question, but I also saw that one of our student government representatives in the audience had something that they would like to ask, so I wanted to check with the mayor if it would be okay if we could. Sure, absolutely. Wonderful. <clears throat> so this is more of a personal um, experience question. Um, for example, my family lives in a back house, so our trash pickup comes from the alley, and um, our address and our information is not as obvious. So like, how would you discern which house, because the front houses use trash cans and their trash pickups in the alleyway as well. So like, how would you determine which trash can belongs to which household? That's a great question. And we know that that is something that we will be having to correct as we start this program. We know that there are areas where, especially cul-de-sacs, they have this sense of putting carts one on top of each, you know, together. So we would not be able, so there will be situations where we won't be able to identify. So obviously we won't be able to do any type but if this recurs through our route reviews then that's why we have 
Josh and we have other members who would then go and investigate and then provide that education. So we are just not going to be relying, and that's important, we're just not gonna be relying on the smart truck and the notices. Like the reports that we'll be sharing with the city, we're gonna review them. And if we have repeat offenders, we're just not gonna continue to send letters for the sake of, because it's obviously not working. It's going to be a pick up the phone and have a conversation with that account owner or in your situation where we may not identify the home is trying to find another solution to it. But, you know, this is a new law and with everything new, there's gonna be a learning curve. And as we, you know, see these hurdles, we have to come up with creative solutions with staff. So I had a few questions for you. The first is, does the fee reset within a time frame? Is it an annual and then It's it annual, so okay. within so the calendar annual. year. Um, and in the, in the instance that you showed us of the trash being dumped into that container, was that the actual bin or does it then get moved into? You're talking about um, this one right here? Yeah, the, the, the video, well, the video, yeah. Yes, so this is what we call the hopper inside the truck. So when the cart goes and actually spills, it's what's the whole inside, I don't even know how to yeah. best to describe, but the whole on top of the truck is called a hopper. And the hopper then, is that where all of the trash is deposited or does it then move into another chamber within the truck? It, so the hopper is the first where the first initial um, whatever is getting service of the car drops. So we get a visual of what's dropping. And once it drops, it then moves into the larger part of the truck where we then compress the trash to make room for more. So in the case of um, if you see contaminants, are you able to remove them at that point? Because I'm just wondering if you had mentioned earlier, if you have some contamination, you have to throw yeah. everything away. I don't really quite understand what everything is. Does that mean that if you have, in that instance, those trash bags, does it contaminate everything else that moves from the hopper into the main chamber? So, no. Um, a I mean, it would be very dangerous for a driver to come out and say, oh, there's some contaminated. We will be servicing the cart. That's why the education happens at there, and the cleanup happens at the actual recycling facility where we have sorters that clean out the recycling material. I see. Um, how are how are apartment buildings and businesses handled? I know that you primarily address this presentation yeah. toward right. single family residents. So apartments um, typically are serviced with commercial bins. So we've already implemented this smart truck and you're probably asking apartments because they are difficult. We're talking about tenants. We're talking about a, you know, a sector of the community that moves often. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge. I'm not going to say that we have the right solution for them. It's a continuous education with uh, even the commercial sector, like a restaurant, um, because, you know, we also have, you know, employees that, it's a high turnover. So we're constantly providing education and training, working with property managers, explaining to them the reason that they have to help us with their tenants improve the recycling. There is a contamination on the commercial, so sometimes that is the incentive for a property manager to work closely with their tenants. And we have great property managers that actually take it upon themselves to do that sorting in their property, but um, it's a challenge and it's ongoing training. That's the best that we can do at this point. As you're rolling this program out, I know California tends to be at the more forefront of uh, recycling initiatives and these types of things. Have you, Waste Management is a national uh, company. Have you implemented this in other cities and other states or is this kind of the first so, implementing a program like this? So um, Northern California is a further <laughs> ahead of us in Southern California, but as far as other parts of the state, they're still catching on to even just normal recycling. But Northern California has taken a little bit of more aggressive approach when it comes to recycling and so forth. The reason why I ask that question is as you implement this program of education, ultimately the goal is to change behavior mm -hmm. and to improve the sorting um, uh, accuracy of homes. And I just wondered, based upon the baseline, people are already putting things in their green waste and putting things in recycling. What would you, what would the expectation be once you have this program in a yeah. year? What 
what would the contamination level be now and what would you expect it to drop to? So that is the baseline that we're going to start. I see. Okay. This, so right? Because we, we, we're just kicking it off. So for me, the first few years is really creating that baseline of really understanding what's happening, particular in San Dimas. That's where I said that that's one of the beauties of this smart truck because we will be able to identify our dirtier routes, right? We will be doing our route contention um, and ID in each route, you know, you know, where, you know, we have multiple routes. So, and so again, it's identifying the dirtiest routes, identifying the baseline. We, you know, we potentially have a baseline already because we do know at this point, we know how many tons we collect of trash, how many tons we collect of recycling. As we start this process, you know, our hope is that we will improve the quality of the recycling that we're going to be collecting from the curbside. And hopefully that will also turn into a higher tonnage on the recycling side that people will be using their recycling cards more often than not. Right. Yeah, but that's the baseline that we're creating with this program. And every year we'll be able to review it. I think that's part of this law is, you know, not only reporting to Cal Recycle, but also having the city and the hauler looking together and seeing, okay, what's working, what's not working, yeah. what do we need to do to move things along. Great. Thank you. I have no further questions. Um, is this going to like increase monthly prices for families? So unfortunately, yes, um, we did. Um, we actually established the what we call the fee for um, SB thirteen eighty three, and that was approved last year, and it went into effect in January. Do you mind reminding? Do you mind reminding me how much was it? Um, it was about a ten percent increase. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and again, that went towards funding all these programs and like I said it's a laundry list of new responsibilities that this law has brought not only for staff to do more work but also for the haulers to support thank you Ryan do you have a question or interested in trash yes sir. thank you uh, actually I had uh, just a couple comments first off uh, thanks for the presentation I think it's always good to be able to educate the public on this particular topic and challenging piece of legislation. Uh, one is, uh, where did the uh, three strikes in San Dimas come from? How did we arrive there? It's a, a program that we establish. It's across um, the different cities where we are adopting this program. It's, you know, it's giving them two chances and then the third and sub subsequent, you know, potential fees. Otherwise, you know, we're not going to correct behavior. It's and and most likely also it's our experience on the commercial side where, you know, we give them chances and once fees come in, then behavior starts happening. Unfortunately, it's that little incentive of a, of a contamination fee that pushes people to do things a little bit more correctly. So it's just a program that we've um, created to present to our cities across. Thank you. I appreciate the, the answer, and I, I may not disagree with the logic, but uh, I will say that I do have heartburn uh, with the notion that people committing real crimes in Los Angeles County, you know, whether it's three times or more, uh, are, are seeing less time, less restitution, less fees, uh, and a San Dimas law-abiding resident who hasn't mastered trash separation is going to have three shots to get this right before we start penalizing them. Uh, so I would hope at some point uh, the three strikes law or policy decision that we implement in San Dimas does lend itself towards more education to gain compliance and change behavior uh, because I, I think there's just a, a hard pill to swallow and you're talking about people who have gone a long time without ever having to do this. So um, anyways, changing gears. Uh, my other question is along the comments of my colleague, uh, Councilmember Nakano, uh, what efforts have been done 
uh, with multifamily developments to be able to work through challenging infrastructure and what solutions has waste management come up with in partnership with the city. Every time we hear about this topic, I can name three or four different locations in the city that are either multifamily or mixed use with commercial and residential tenants that have bins for which they cannot accommodate the new bins to be able to do the separation. So what what uh, what solutions have you guys come up with for those situations? So with multifamily, Council Member Vienna, that has been in place since 2016. Um, it is something that has been a process. Um, it, it involves working heavily with property management companies, having meetings with HOAs. I'm sorry, who's speaking? I'm sorry, this is Lauren. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we're working with waste management and oftentimes if we go to a property manager um, or if we have an HOA meeting, we will meet with not just the city, it's the waste management representative as well that attends those meetings. We have numerous education materials that we make available to those property manager companies and HOAs and we'll work one-on-one -on -one, as Lily mentioned with those folks as needed. Okay, that was, uh, you know, I under I hear what you're saying, but I think what I have a challenge with is that I can think of three areas right now that are not, we don't have tangible solutions for. So um, I hear working one-on-one -on -one with them, but, uh, you know, I'm not hearing solutions, I guess, in the context of either, are there smaller bins, perhaps, or are more pickups at the expense of these residents is what's gonna be expected ultimately to facilitate the compliance. We are avoiding that where we can. We have developed, or actually Waste Management is working with um, the city of San Dimas as well as the city of Laverne on what's called split carts. And that those are smaller. So think of like a three yard bin, half of it would be for organic waste and half of it would be for trash or, um, recyclables and trash. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Lauren. You know, this is my favorite topic. And uh, I think to some of the points that were raised earlier, you know, I, I'm, I'm just waiting to help people uh, install their ring cameras to be able to catch people dumping into their trash cans so they can dispute some of the contamination issues. Uh, I think the other concern, you know, just from some of the folks that I've heard uh, about this is concerns about wildlife in the area. You know, we have plenty of, uh, I think they call them trash can pandas or raccoons that uh, get into people's trash and, um, you know, just taking things out of bags, I think can create a, a more challenging uh, dilemma in our community. But uh, I guess we'll, we'll get there, uh, three strikes or not. I actually just thought of a question, so uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, every now and then, one of our dogs will catch a gopher in our backyard, and we're really happy they do that because the gophers are making a mess of our yard. Uh, what bin do the gophers go in? Trash. 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 <laughs> okay. There's a separate right gopher now. bin now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you don't necessarily know if a gopher has been poisoned or if it's carrying a disease and you don't want that going into your organics cart. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Any, anyone else wishing to ask a question? Cora, any more? Thank you, Lily. Thank you, thank you for your time. All right. Okay, any, we'll move on to uh, oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the City Council on any item on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comment will not be taken during each individual agenda item except for public hearing items. Comments on public hearing items will be heard when that item is scheduled for discussion. Under the provisions of the Brown Act, 
The legislative body is prohibited from engaging in discussions on any item not appearing on a posted agenda. However, your concerns may be referred to a staff or set for discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to speaking once for up to three minutes. Madam, Madam Clerk. Our first speaker would be Laura Brantley, speaking on the introduction of the office of Senator Susan Rubio. Laura. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, both here and elsewhere. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. My name is Laura Brantley and I'm here on behalf of the office of Senator, State Senator Susan Rubio. I wanted to introduce our office to the City Council and City of San Dimas. State Senator Susan Rubio has been in office. She's now in her second term at the California State Senate and due to redistricting, now we get to the opportunity to represent the beautiful city of San Dimas. I personally am from the Inland Empire, so I'm very excited about this. Um, she has been in office for four years prior to this. Before that, she was a city council member with the city of Baldwin Park for 17 years. And before that, she was a public school teacher for 14 years and city clerk. She is an advocate for domestic violence survivors, and that also means that she is a strong supporter for law enforcement and public safety officers. She works on these issues along with uh, housing, regional housing at the state senate level. I wanted to make myself available to you and to the constituents of San Dimas um, as she is traveling back and forth between Sacramento and San Dimas. So if there's anything that we can do to help facilitate uh, local and state uh, correspondence, I will be your point of contact going forward when she is in Sacramento. As you know, she is a very busy state senator, so I'm sure you'll come in contact with her uh, very often. But in the meantime, if there's anything I can do for you, I will make sure that my email, my cell, my direct line are all available to you so that we can see each other throughout the year every week as often as your constituents need. I also did want to say, as the state senator is a strong supporter of local education, she does um, come from a public school background, that she would like to recognize the youth and government participants today. This is how everyone gets involved right in high school. So thank you all so much for your participation. Again, thank you so much for having me here tonight, San Dimas. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker would be Pete Sleweth with the public comment. Just some quick updates on Metro and Metrolink. First, I'd like to bring up the recent $400 million Metrolink Redlands extension, which has around five miles of tracks in the city and is very similar to San Dimas in that an abandoned rail track was utilized for a new transit system without necessary mitigations. Since the opening less than six months ago, there have been four fatalities in three separate incidences, including one suicide. Recently, a car was hit by a train and a mother and her 11-year-old child were killed in a quiet zone as they were stuck in traffic. Apparently the driver had stopped beyond the limit line and when the crossing arms came down, they hit the car roof and she panicked and went forward and within four seconds was crushed by a 50 mile per hour oncoming train, which only was carrying two passengers, which never even had a chance to blow its horn. This was in a quiet zone crossing with all safety measures working properly. The KTLA news report said, locals say the intersection where the crash took place is a dangerous one. It's very busy and there are other, often people who don't stop when they are supposed to at the intersection, said Nicholas, who commutes to Redlands for work. They stop in the middle of the intersection because there are so many cars lined up. So I can see an accident happening pretty easily. Looking at Google Earth for this area, I noticed that the nearby California Street crossing had the same issue and it even is captured on their camera. About five cars are between the light and the left turn lane to access the 10 freeway, then a very narrow corridor for the railroad tracks, then a line of cars behind. If the car in front of you stops before you think it will be there, a car on your bumper, and if there's a car on your bumper, you are no, in no man's land in the train corridor. And if a silent train is coming and the arms come down in your car, the result can be tragic. Investigators said if she had remained where she was, the train would have missed her. But again, she apparently panicked when the arms came down on the roof of her car and she moved forward. This same agency has created this very dangerous situation is the same one working on our quiet zone. And I repeat my concerns having an inadequate fencing with high speed trains and very limited visibility. In both cases, I would suggest if Metrolink can't build in more safety, they need to take a speed limit for the trains in these extremely dangerous sections for which would give everyone more time to react, as well as increasing the likelihood of people surviving, especially if safety is really their top priority. We place speed limits on traffic, and these 50 mile per hour trains, or 79 for Metrolink and San Dimas, 
are dangerous and should be required to operate at a safe speed within their operating environment. Luckily, our light rail crossing at San Dimas Avenue shouldn't have these deadly consequences as trains are either approaching San Dimas Avenue from a complete stop or have already slowed down approaching the station. Do I think light rail, will, right, right, light rail here will be a traffic nightmare? I'd also like to mention there were two more stabbings on the Metro light rail system last week. One was fatal. And finally, Metro is testing playing loud classical music at one of their stations to discourage people from loitering. If I hear loud classical music start playing here while I speak, I know the mayor must have taken this to heart and a signal for me to stop talking. <laughs> I'd like to submit my comments for the public record. Thank you, Thank you Pete. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council? Those are all the public speaker cards I received. Anyone wishing to speak to the council at this time? Ms. Louvet? Hello, good evening, council, students, and Mr. Mayor. It's lovely to see all of you here this evening. So the pictures on 15 of the agenda packet focus mostly on overwhelming trash receptacles, not necessarily the contamination of the material within the receptacles. I did look at them very thoroughly. Since a picture does say a thousand words, am I to humbly assume that the majority of the focus will not be placed upon the sorting of materials? since it appears that we are actually using these receptacles correctly, at least to the best of my sight. But on the overfilling of these bins and on messy bins, given that the base salary and the awards with incentives equals the millions of dollars for top waste management executives, that's according to their last annual report, that also, that same report also indicates the following. In 2020, they indicate a detrimental tax impact of 27 million non-deductible transactional costs related to the acquisition of advanced disposal. That's who's responsible for trying to ensure that we have proper waste management disposal. In addition, clear indication that waste management business model could be adversely affected by strategic decisions if these changes are not made to their portfolio and concerns with not being able to achieve sustainability according to SB 1383. Now, I am in full favor of maintaining stability. Please don't think that I'm not because I one, heart, one wholeheartedly believe in the green mission. What I do not believe in is putting that mission on the backs of myself and my fellow residents here in the city of San Dimas. I can't help but feel that here in the city of San Dimas, myself and my neighbors might be shouldering the cost of some capital expenditures. So perhaps maybe we might want to cap the fees before we consider trying to just cap the lid. Anyways, just a little food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council at this time? Seeing, seeing none, we'll move into the consent calendar. Madam Mayor. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion unless a member of the city council requests separate discussion. I move approval, approval of the consent calendar. Second. Any further questions? Can I get a vote, please? So this will be a roll call. All in favor say aye. We'll need a roll call. Oh, yeah, that's. We'll, we'll this, up again. Roll call. All right, we got a roll call. Can I get a roll call, please? It's because Ryan is out of state. Mayor Badar? Yes. Yes. Mayor Pratam Ebner? Aye. Council Member Nakano? Aye. Council Member Vienna? Yes. Council Member Weber? Yes. Motion carried by a 5 0 vote. Thank you. Motion carries 
Okay, uh, this time we're going to move to other business. We're going to get an update from the downtown specific plan project, a verbal report from the staff. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, and members of the City Council, as well as the members of uh, San Dimas High School. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, the last downtown specific plan update um, that staff actually provided has been quite some time. The last update was provided in uh, June 28th, 2022. Since that time, city staff has worked closely with the downtown specific plan consultant team. In fact, there have been two community workshops and an environmental scoping meeting that has taken place in the past um, eight months. The third community workshop occurred on August 11th, 2022 inside the community building. At that meeting, the consultant team shared a draft land use concept map, which you can see on the slide with the public indicating different zoning areas within the specific plan, which consisted of Gateway Village West, oops, which is the teal aquamarine color um, you see on, on, the, on, on the screen. This zone is envisioned as a prime redevelopment uh, area uh, that would help bring more activity and vibrancy uh, to the downtown. There's also Gateway Village East, um, which is the eastern entrance um, of the city and located and abuts established residential uses um, to the north and east. Additionally, there's the, the Transit Village area, which is the magenta uh, colored area which is a, spe a special zone focused on station adjacent parcels and blocks. There is the town core area in the sort of pink uh, salmon color as you will, um, which marks the traditional historic downtown segment of the specific plan area. The other two additional zones uh, areas are the um, open space zones, which we see are existing open space areas in the city as well as um, the yellow areas, which represent the public and semi-public um, areas within the city. Um, for instance, the post office, civic center, um, and, and um, sheriff's station. So from the public meeting, on August 11, 2022. Um, this is just a, a snippet of some of the comments that the public had provided um, to staff and the consultant team. Um, overall, um, from the community meeting number three, many of the members of the public were generally comfortable with the plan areas presented and felt that it, it, it suited to have an East Village, a, a West Village, as well as Town Core and, and Transit Village area. The community also shared that they felt that they wanted a more desire for community areas open spaces, um, public art, and preserving some of the historic areas and buildings of the downtown. There was also a very strong desire for more restaurants and activity um, and, and nightlife supporting businesses in the, in the proposed downtown area. Um, additional comments that were provided included mobility linkages. Um, and the consultant team also shared and discussed with the public opportunities and constraints uh, among them included a desire for pedestrian improvements and enhancing pedestrian safety, um, a desire for improved bicycle infrastructure, um, but the majority did share that they felt that bike lanes located on other streets um, versus Bonita Avenue. Um, there was also a desire to connect the new, as you call the, the west part of the city, close to the 57 freeway, and the old, um, the east downtown area through streetscape improvements. Um, also shared with staff and the consultant team was a very high priority um, for parking, providing the downtown area. Additionally, on no in November 2022, um, an environmental scoping meeting was held inside the council chambers. Our environmental consultant team, so uh, us consult, so consultant team, Meridian shared the different components of the draft environment impact report and discussed some of the impacts that will be analyzed. 
The public review period was from November 2nd to December 2nd. As you can see in the slide shown above, this is the area we've completed. Currently, right now, we are working on the draft ERR. Um, the consultant team is still preparing the EIR, and once it's been provided to staff for review, the public will be notified accordingly. If I, if I may, f since we have members of the audience who are new here, could, would you mind also explaining when you have an acronym, what that stands for? Yes. So uh, CEQA, as you see, is a California Environmental Quality, um, and that is an environmental process that for any project development that you project any environmental impacts, let's say in increased traffic, increased noise, um, circulation issues, um, that it would be analyzed. So as part of the downtown specific plan, and forgive me for not explaining earlier for our high school students, um, this process actually began um, back in 2021. And the city, this is a, uh, the city's third attempt um, to envision and create this development plan document. And the idea behind it is to uh, revitalize um, areas in the downtown, expand the existing boundary. A lot of residents feel that the existing boundary um, is basically from Cataract up until um, you know, San Dimas Avenue. And this downtown specific plan is intended to actually expand it all the way west to the 57 freeway and eastward um, uh, past uh, Pony, uh, near Pony Expressway. So this process in and of itself, um, because we're looking at and not analyzing infrastructure, analyzing um, traffic impacts, uh, noise, and increased development, um, particularly residential and commercial within this area, there are anticipated a number of environmental impacts, including air quality. And in the next slide, as I show you, um, these are the potential operational impacts that the specific plan document will actually um, analyze. So. In this, you will see that based on the initial study that the consultant provided, the development potential of the plan will be evaluated on its air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, um, population growth, public services, recreation, and transportation, as well as utilities. Um, with increased land uses that come and increased uh, density that comes, there will be a need for updating, upgrading infrastructure, upgrading existing facilities within the downtown, public streets, walkways, sidewalks. And so the draft environmental impact report, EIR, will analyze all of those areas and will present that to the public uh, once the draft becomes available. And there will be a public comment period, um, which I would actually encourage the high school students, if you're interested, definitely um, read through the document or even share with your family and specifically homeowners and who may not be aware, but you know, we want your input, we want your feedback, um, and these are some of the areas that they will analyze. There'll be more additional areas as well, um, but these are some of the, the, the points. Um, that were discussed at the November 16th um, scoping meeting. Additionally, so at the, just a week and a half ago, um, the city actually held our fourth community workshop. Uh, this fourth community workshop was actually postponed from earlier month uh, due to uh, inclement weather. So um, it was postponed to March 29th, and we had some good participation uh, from the meeting, and this is just an example of a land use table that city staff and the consultant team are working on um, uh, and wanted to share with the public. The fourth community workshop was held in the senior center. The downtown specific plan consultant team provided a broad overview of comments they'd received from the public and also presented their progress thus far. Um, the draft land use table, as you see, I know it's a little difficult to, to, to read due to the, the, the font size, but it's just to let you know that um, the city is looking to introduce types of use permits, such as a minor use permit, which would currently, which we currently do not have, but would help streamline the process for certain uses. We're looking to also create some development standards that would, let's say for instance, have, you have 
two stories frontages, but then you also have the third floor set back um, to create, create more relief from taller um, height buildings. So this is another example of uh, three stories adjacent to public street. And some of you may be familiar with some of the, the buildings here, uh, if you've been to Claremont. And as you can see, this is a good example of where along the street frontage, it's two stories. But what you may, may not know is it's actually a third story. But it's set back. And for example, in the diagram here, shows a 12 foot minimum setback just to kind of create some relief. So that way when you're walking along the sidewalk, you're not surrounded by really tall height buildings where you feel that you don't have that open pedestrian walkway realm. Um, so this is an example of some of the setbacks uh, and some, just a diagram of what our consultant team is looking to propose and then we will present to the public. Out of curiosity, would those setbacks um, enable balconies or would that just be purely the setback only? So these setback, just purely setback only. I see. So you wouldn't yes. be able to put a balcony where that yes. space is okay. Yes. And this is an example of what the consultant team is looking at um, based on input that was received by the public in the past, um, the earlier three workshops. And just on that, on that very question, um, so I know um, I was at that uh, meeting you were talking about, and I thought you were saying that that could be um, a spot, you know, place for a patio for the resident up on, up yes, on top. Yes, it could be, yes. Was that your question, Eric? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes. So the building itself, the, 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 the wall plane is set back, but yes, that could be utilized as a patio space um, or just sort of open area, but um, recreational space for whatever the users are, the, um, the tenants for that building. So also shown at the workshop were example development um, standards, setbacks, um, and these are conceptual renderings to demonstrate to the public potential opportunity site. Um, I want to repeat, this is just a conceptual rendering. There isn't a developer coming in and proposing this today to the city. Um, the efforts of the consultant team is merely to just provide to the public a visual example of what could be done based on the language and the standards that our consultant team is looking to propose. So based on the input received from the public, um, this, if you're familiar, this is a 57 freeway to the west. This is Arrow Highway, and this is your San Dima station north and your San Dima station south. So Red Vama's not going away tomorrow, neither you know, is Denny's, so this is, again, just representative. Example, we had a lot of questions at the community workshop number four that a lot of residents really felt that um, there was a developer coming in. So I just want to emphasize that this is just a conceptual rendering. So here is a rendering provided from the consultant. This is just sort of a streetscape view of what it could look like. Um, in this example here, you're looking westbound along Arrow Highway. And if you will think of this building as, you know, we're active ride shop, the existing vacant active ride shop is. And this is a, just a conceptual proposed community building. And then this includes improved streetscape improvements um, for pedestrians. So, but as you can see, it's set back. You have these areas along the corner where you can have relief um, from having the building just set up right against the, um, the sidewalk. And then you have the streetscape and medians that also um, give it more of a pedestrian friendly and welcoming experience. Here's another example of Bonita Avenue looking west. So this is you're going westbound to the Fitzsimmer Freeway. And again, example of showing opportunities and areas of public space, amenities, outdoor dining, that a lot of members of the public were um, really emphasizing and wanted a desire, more of a desire for in our downtown area. So again, just concept. And then this view also shows, again, setback areas showing, and then some architectural relief and standards that we, will, that we are looking to include as part of our development standards as well. Additionally, these are just examples um, the pub for the public. We had our subconsultant team, IBI group. They shared different examples of bike uh, class bike lanes. So as you can see, this is an example 
this doesn't mean what's being presented, but this is an example of what could be done and some discussion points of a class two bike lane example where you have um, on-street bicycle facilities marked by a painted line without any vertical separation uh, between the bike lane and the traffic. So this is what you kind of, you see very similarly um, on Bonita Avenue on, on the Laverne side. And then this here is an example of a class three bike route example where what you'd call a shero, and in this case, you have bicycle facilities shared with um, vehicles that are also driving along the lanes, as well as parked vehicles. And then a pedestrian sort of uh, public right of way with trees, with trees, and then sidewalk and a stoop to kind of also give some relief um, for potential residential buildings. Lastly, the public was provided comment cards um, to share their feedback, and there is still opportunity on MindMixer, which is the city's current interactive website um, for having public input and comments from residents. Um, residents are, allowed, are able to view the presentation and share their comments. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity for the high school students, um, if, you're, if you haven't already or know about it, uh, I think it, it's actually be a good opportunity to have your classmates actually sign up for the MindMixer website and see some of the comments that um, the members of the public have shared and provide your own additional input as well. Um, the past year, as part of the input, um, staff did make uh, presence at the farmer's market as well, try to get input um, from residents and kind of share some of the ideas. And so this is another opportunity since the, the meeting that was held on March 29th um, for members of the public to uh, continue providing comments. You can also view the, the full presentation slides. Um, the slide that I provided to you today is just a snippet. It doesn't have the full presentation. So feel free, go ahead, go on MindMixer, um, provide some comments. I believe the comments um, will be in the question, will be made available um, for, for, for 30 days, for a month, uh, for the public to provide comments. And uh, until then, uh, we will have an additional fifth community workshop. At that workshop, it will be jointly with the Planning Commission, members of the public, and the City Council. And uh, that date is yet to be determined. So thank you so much. I'm available if you have any questions. questions. Isabella? Hi, I just want to say I think it's really cool that you guys want to revitalize downtown. Sorry. I think it's really cool that you guys want to revitalize downtown. I have an idea for advertisement with the high schoolers. This would be kind of simple. Just a flyer with a QR code to the MyMixer account, and I think we could put it around school. I think it would be really cool. I know a lot of high schoolers, like, we drive to, like, uh, downtown Claremont or downtown Laverne to get that, like, nice downtown feel where you could go to, like, um, the locations that were listed here. So I know a lot of um, high schoolers would be really interested in um, kind of getting that feel instead of like having to drive 20 minutes, you know? So yeah, that was it. Thank you for the feedback. We'll definitely take things to duration. Any other questions? And I had a couple questions. Oh, go, I'm gonna go ahead and defer to the student. So I did have a quick question. Would um, providing these comments be available through the City of San Dimas app at any point? That is a very good question. Um, at this time, a lot of the, the public comments is kind of centralized in the MindMixer app. Um, I'm sure we could work with um, our um, information systems manager and see if maybe having any questions. But right now, we're looking MindMixer is the, the platform that we're using to, inc to encompass all comments um, on, from the public. Okay. So right now, there is still availability for you to even review older comments from residents early on in the process. There's actually um, an interactive sort of GIS map where you can actually place comments on the map. Let's say, for instance, there's an area where you felt there could be more uh, better traffic safety. You can actually input that comment, and you can actually review. So that's still live, and you can still review those comments, um, and actually review some of the old comments too. There's a lot of feedback from the public um, as part of the comments section for the MindMixer app. You could even include photos. We've had, I know it's 
you, it's been pretty active when we announce a new sort of item to comment on. Um, so early on in the process when we had launched the Mind Mixer app, we actually had a lot of residents uh, comment, share links to other cities, even links to European cities, and even uh, photographs that they shared of other areas, just as um, your colleague mentioned um, in Claremont, or other areas that they felt can benefit the San city of San Dimas and its residents. So um, right now, not yet on the Mind Mixer app, but I'm sure maybe at some point um, we could consider that. Just right now, Mind Mixer is the, the sole platform that we're using. Okay, so just to clarify, does that platform have a phone app or is it purely website only? It's purely website, unfortunately. Okay. It's pre-programmed and it's not a lot of customization. Okay, I understand, just clarification. Okay. No worries. Hey, and so as always, thanks a lot for staff's work on this. This, this is a major, major undertaking and there have been a lot of hours put in by, by our staff of course and then we've got the consultant um, and along with the big effort it's going to have a huge impact as you mentioned going forward for San Dimas for a way long time in the future. Uh, I had just a couple questions and you had mentioned there's going to be a planning commission and city council joint meeting at some point in probably in the summer or something like that. Is that kind of where we're looking? Yes. Probably. So that, that'll be I'll save a bunch of things until then, but just um, a couple of questions at this point. Um, so a lot of the sites, uh, part, of part of the reason we're doing this, part of the reason, is to uh, rezone or specify certain areas for housing because, um, and, and there was that one map that showed it, and I remember there's a, another chart that shows how many units each area is, but uh, just an overall number um, what is the general capacity number of units that the downtown specific plan in its current draft um, draft form, how many units are going to be available or people could, if they built out all everything to its max in each area? I know with, um, and I'm glad you mentioned this, I, I failed to mention it earlier, um, just for the knowledge of the high school students and the rest of the public, the shaded areas are what uh, Council Member uh, Pro Tem Ebener was mentioning is our housing element designated sites. And these sites were um, sites that were um, identified in our certified housing element. These, er uh, these sites have minimum certain density requirements to reach the city's allocated regional um, housing needs assessment. And the city is, is required to allocate about you know, 1,200 units. And within these sites, the majority of those sites um, are located in the downtown specific plan. And so um, before, I before I address Council Member Ebener's uh, question, I do want to clarify that within these areas, there will be certain densities, uh, certain heights, certain densities. And let's say, for instance, uh, you have your town core area here, and the intention is for you to, to keep it you know, two to three stories, nothing more. And let's say you have your East Village area, uh, similarly, you know, three stories, nothing more. Because of the sites that are designated in the housing element sites, those specific sites will have their own provisions in order to meet um, the housing uh, needs assessment. So even though, that, and, we, and we wouldn't want to carry the same density of the housing element sites across the entirety of East uh, of the West Village, and we wouldn't want to carry the housing element designation for the sites along the East area. So only those designated in the housing element site will have a much higher density. Um, just to clarify, in terms of the numbers for how many units for this whole area, that that has not been truly calculated yet. Um, right now, just based on the proposal that we've shared and the the renderings that we've shared, the rendering itself just sort of hits the minimum uh, threshold that mm -hmm. the housing element has identified. So it might be in the case that, let's say, we have some sites that are not housing element sites. Let's say, for instance, um, in this area that will have, let's say, for instance, you know, three, three story, four stories, and they have mixed use, horizontal mixed use, or vertical mixed use of residential and commercial, um, those units, may increase, let's say, the, then the housing element, man. Um, you might have 
a lot more units. And then, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, from uh, our development director, that we have to at least allocate and rezone the minimum quantities. But if there are other sites within the downtown specific plan area that may be able to offset um, some of those units, um, I think our director can better respond for that. Okay, thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council members and students. Uh, Henry No, Director of Community Development. Uh, with regards to uh, ARENA, um, there is a minimum density. There's a, a minimum number of units that we have to meet for each one of those um, shaded areas that Anne had mentioned. Um, if there are areas that um, potentially go above that minimum, um, that may reduce other requirements because we'll be able to um, illustrate that we've built a certain amount in certain areas. But for each one of those areas, we have to make sure that we meet the minimum because if we don't meet the minimum, we have to transfer those units somewhere else. We can't, there's a, a legislation called no net loss. So if we don't hit that minimum, we have to transfer those units somewhere else to a different property. Totally understand. Um, the, how the downtown specific plan includes all but three of the sites uh, designated in the uh, housing element that you were talking about. Correct. And those three sites are all just on the border, basically, just north of the uh, where Lowe's is and, and Red Roof Inn and all that kind of stuff. So they're just on the other side of the tracks. Um, the allocation was 1248, as you mentioned. Last, we just got a report saying we did 39 units last year. None of them were affordable, but still, in the total, they're you know we're getting down close to the 1200 mark. Um, and as you're saying, those housing element sites, uh, the ones that are hashed there, and those other three I mentioned, were looked upon as being the 1248 units. In addition, though, there are other parcels that are designated and as, as Ann was mentioning are going to be zoned or designated for some amount of density and there's anywhere from 30 to 45 units per acre and and as we all know nobody's forced to redevelop Lowe's isn't going to be torn down and housing put in there uh, anytime soon I don't think um, but the, our our obligation is to make it s so that people could do that if they wanted to repurpose the bowling alley lot or, or whatever. Correct. What I'm interested in, and maybe we could just get this number for the Planning Commission and City Council study session, is if you add up all the possible units at whatever density is proposed, how many units are there, what's the capacity of the downtown specific plan? I, I had in fact heard that it was around 2,300, but I would like to get that as more of a firm number, closer in a range, you know, within 100 or so, so that we realize, again, with this major undertaking, what kinds of changes the downtown specific plan is going to bring to, to the downtown. Correct. Right. And okay. we, can, we can provide that at a, at a future meeting. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, let's see, I just had, uh, that was the, the main question. I'm, um, the one thing I wanted, I think only, was two other questions. Um, one is, um, as we uh, do the designation of the, the different areas, um, I'd like to make sure that we provide additional, I think you mentioned it, and public green space. Um, and this could be anything from on rooftops that's public, or at least for people in that building, to actually ground level um, I was talking to some people from the cycling community recently, and one thing they like is gathering here or there to start their rides. And if in cycle is still around, you know, a little gathering spot would be neat. But uh, public spaces like a, like that are true open to the public and not part of a development that close at, you know, whatever time. Um, so I just wanted to make that as a comment. And then the last question is about parking. You were talking about parking being uh, important, and um, you know we're. We're going to be selling the city park and ride, which is now city parking. We're going to be selling that to the gold line, to be called the L line pretty soon. Um, and so we're not going to have that parking. Where is the public, or what's the strategy for providing uh, public parking, especially free public parking, for people who want to enjoy all these amenities that we're putting in? 
So one of the uh, sub-consultants that Anne mentioned is IBI Group, which is a traffic engineering consultant. Um, they're conducting a parking management kind of a master plan, looking at uh, max build out, seeing what the available parking is currently existing today, um, looking at if everything built out um, to the max, um, kind of what number do we need to provide to provide that extra parking. Um, but they're in the middle of developing that at this point. So we're looking at analyzing that to provide that as another piece of information for this entire uh, All right. downtown specific plan. Okay. Thanks a lot for the work. I had a question. Um, how are like historical buildings and I guess so-called landmarks going to be affected by this? So our town core, so we have buildings within our town core. Um, we just have a survey of kind of listed buildings. Um, nothing is uh, historically designated landmarks, uh, local or higher than that is my understanding. But our intent for the downtown core, the existing, um, we'll call it the historic buildings, um, is to preserve those in place. One other question to parades, where where would those be moved if we're doing construction to build stuff? Uh, like our, like we have our homecoming parade every year and our uh, Christmas, like events, if construction were to be taking place, would those be moved or would they? We'd work with Public Works and uh, Sheriff's Department and such to be able to reroute some of these events and such. Sure, just like we have construction now <laughs> so we'll, we'll work together to make sure we can provide some type of alternate route thank you you'll have plenty of notice <laughs> <laughs> all right any, any further questions I was just wondering we've been talking about this downtown st strategic plan for as long as I can remember uh, and uh, my question is we want to involve the entire community, obviously. What is our participation level? Okay, because I could talk to people today, walk out on the street, and people have no idea what we're talking about. What, what is, what, what's our level of participation through the community? So I know that through our public participation efforts, um, we've blasted this out on our social media platforms. Um, Every community meeting we have, we send out public notices and we provide um, social media blasts and email blasts as well for that. Our Mind Mixer account, everything's on our website so they can be able to access that 24 seven. Um, I know that the consultant and city staff has made every effort to try and get um, public participation because that is important um, and we're still thinking of other areas that we can to help get, maybe we can get the high school involved and like you said, get QR codes and flyers out to the, the high schools and other schools to be able to hand out to the students so that hopefully we can get the, these uh, student population involved as well. Hey, the, just a few weeks ago, we had strategic plan meeting four. Uh, how, how, how many people did actually attend it? So I'm being told about 40-ish. 40? So it's about 40, not including staff and the consultant team. Um, okay. Since the our initial meeting, our numbers have dropped um, compared to, I think, our first meeting that was held virtually um, through the pandemic um, before we had fully reopened to have um, in-workshop meetings. Um, that attendance was almost 80, um, um, 80 participants. The second meeting, which was um, held in May of, la of last year, and was our, pers our first in-person workshop held in the senior center, uh, that attendance was about was little was about 60 individuals, um, and the space for the senior center was it was very cramped. It, it felt like a lot of people, and so then in the the third community workshop, we moved it through the community building so that we had a lot more room, a lot more space, and to have stations. And um, I believe that participation was. Be between 40 and 50 as well. 
Um, and then the last recent meeting um, was about you know, 40 participants. When and we're putting out this information for each, each of these meetings, what is our, how are we putting this out? So we do send flyers the, every time we have a workshop meeting to uh, within a 500 foot radius of the downtown specific plan boundary, as well as additional residents all the way up into Gladstone. And then we have our weekly um, social media blasts on Facebook, on Twitter, um, as well as um, the Mind Mixer website. I, I keep track of all of the emails uh, and residents who sign up and with every workshop, initially, the first workshop, I only had about 30 emails of people who were interested in learning about it. That list has grown. That list has grown to over 100 emails, um, so much that I'm having to work with our IT to um, figure out a better way to kind of send information out to a much larger listserv. So, and we, and I, I recognize the residents and the developers and agents who have been coming repeatedly to some of the meetings. And I also recognize some new residents um, who heard by word of mouth through their neighbors and so forth. Um, and I, I do get calls from residents too, who might sh you know, share with me that they, they're, not, they're not able to make it, but they'll give me their comments and so forth. So I know that the numbers may not um, show, but, we do have residents who do email me, um, residents who do comment on the Mind Mixer website as well, um, as well as residents who, who do give me a call. A few residents actually, when we had the workshop that had to be postponed, I think a couple of residents actually showed up and a few of them called me and just to verify whether it was uh, still uh, postponed. Um, but we will make, you know, we're trying as much as we can to get the word out and get some uh, more feedback from the, from the community. You know, since we have the, the future le leaders of the, our community here with us tonight, could, what is the demographics of the, at these meetings as far as, you know, the age groups that are showing up? Um, we've had a mixture of long-term residents who've been living in the community, as well as a mixture of um, young residents who've recently moved into the community, started their families um, or who grew up in the community and who've come back and now are starting their homes. Um, so we do, that's majority of the demographic. Um, we've had not as many from the, the student population um, of high school students and younger. So the majority of the demographics has been, you know, young home ownership within this, the community as well as a long time residence. I, I, I know that several members of this community, in fact, lots of members of this community, um, relish the fact that, that we have people moving back to the community that graduated from San Dimas High School, graduated in the rest of the community, and as a parent, you know, it, it's really neat to watch your child move back to the community that they grew up in, and they're teaching at San Dimas High School, and they're teaching other places, and so one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the housing element is a providing a, a place that people can, that our kids can move back here and be able to afford a place to live. Uh, you know, we don't get, we don't have that mu much of that type of stock because our housing, you know, try to go up to, you know, tr try to go up to Via Verde and buy a house. It's probably not real, realistic that, you know, when you first graduate from college or something like that, but it's, it is a pretty neat thing. And I think most of the people on this council would agree that it's, it's one of the goals that w we would like to see. And I mean, I get calls all the time from, from uh, people who've been around here for a long time, been very much involved in our community saying, I'd like to have my, my kids move back or my grandkids move back, but you guys don't do anything to help us. And, and I'm hoping that this type of program gets out there and, 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 is, and is very helpful. Um, back in one of the original, um, in fact, on this, this slide, when you were talking and you were pointing out the different uh, colors, you know, of, of what was going on, you used the word village. Okay, where did that come from? Because you said you have the village on this side, a village here, a village there. Where, where does that come from? Because, you know, I heard things today talking about the old down down district, the new downtown district, and, and where, where, where does the word village come from? 
It's just an easy way to be able to distinguish between different areas. So we can't just have one downtown area culmination into the whole downtown specific plan, but there's different areas that would have different characteristics or different uh, building massing and such. Um, so we, we need to categorize those differently. So as Anne was mentioning, like the, I'll say the light blue along the western area that's adjacent mainly to the freeway, that's your gateway village west. And it's just a name, just like we have specific plans. So there's just different areas. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to ask a question, follow up? It's great job. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Anne. Sorry. Oh. I just have a quick question. What's like a rough timeline for like the development? Like, that's uh, it. So the first thing to do is to get the downtown specific plan adopted and approved through Planning Commission and City Council. Um, that will lay out the groundwork for the goals the development standards and kind of the vision for this area. After that, it depends on the market. Um, more than likely about five to 10 years before you see some type of movement um, initially. Um, that would be <coughs> the earliest because you still have to go through approvals after this uh, document. But this document is extremely important because this is laid out on the foundation and the vision of what the community and the council wants. So uh, downtown LA in three years, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so downtown LA, yeah. <laughs> Took many years. All right, any, any further questions? Hi, I was just, oh. I was just curious, uh, when you were mentioning like your social media blast, how much engagement you normally like get? Mm, like, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. <coughs> I'm sorry, I was just asking during your social media blast how much engagement you get with each, each post. So with our social media blast, it's mainly to get the word out on our um, community meetings, but it's also, it would be people going to the actual mind mixer, so we'd have to get that, that data from uh, our consultant. Um, but it's mainly guiding people to the website to be able to show them kind of um, all the information and get input from them. As a suggestion, I was just wanted to suggest maybe like posting the link to my mixer in the Facebook group, uh, Sandy Miss Buzz. Sandy Miss Buzz. And uh, Nextdoor, I know many like members of the community are active in those Facebook groups and on Nextdoor, so I think you can reach a larger community and get more engagement if you post on there. Thank you. Good input. Thank you. Any Anyone else? Ma'am? Hi. Um, I have a question. So as someone who lives in San Dimas and also worked in San Dimas, I see the way that construction is really hurt traffic and it makes it really hard to get around. And I'm just wondering how we're gonna restrict traffic from also harming the pre-established businesses here and foot traffic that's already limited. So in the future, I mean, this is a plan, a long-term plan, a long-term planning plan. Um, it won't be redeveloped all at one time. So the amount of construction that you see for the goal line, obviously that's being built all at one time. Um, but we will, like I said, for the events and such, we'll work with all the departments um, and the public and the, just advise them of if there's any closures or any uh, rerouting and such, um, we'll, we'll make sure. But that's many years down the line, so. Ryan, Ryan, you have something you'd like to ask? Ryan? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't, but uh, it's nearly, it'll be about midnight, so in about 20 minutes, I'll be dropping off the line here. I have to be up early. All right, did everybody hear that? Ryan's about ready to drop off into La La Land. <laughs> Ryan, thank you for attending. Oh. I'll hang out for 20 more minutes, Mayor. I'll drop off at midnight here. 
All right, you guys got 20 more minutes of questions. <laughs> okay. All right, any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to our uh, second discussion, and that'll be a, discuss a discussion on consideration, authorization for the city manager to an execute a lease agreement between the city of San Dimas and Vincenzo's Terrazas Incorporated for space at the Walker House at 121 North San Dimas Avenue. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've owned and maintained the Walker House since 2000. It's actually the only nationally designated historic building in the city. And to your question about is there anything historic downtown, that actually is in the downtown specific plan. That's on the furthest north side of San Dimas Avenue, on the west side of San Dimas Avenue, next to First Street. We have have historically had a number of restaurants uh, in that location. And during the pandemic, our last restaurant um, stopped operating due to the pandemic. This was Luca Bella's. That was its original parent company out of Glendora that opened up in our building. And it was vacant since then. The second floor has been occupied by the San Dimas Historical Society um, that generally operated in tandem with the restaurant, allowing for foot traffic to go upstairs and be able to partake of a lot of historical artifacts regarding the history of the city. And so we're very excited today that the council has engaged in a significant amount of conversation last year about what we want to place into the Walker House. A restaurant uh, was the predominant uh, item that we wanted in that both the community and the council and what we entered into is a negotiations with Vincenzo's restaurant out of Covina. Vincenzo's will be leaving their current location and relocating the entire operation to the first floor of the Walker House so there will not be a second restaurant. It's a prime it's their primary focus will be at the Walker House. They will take uh, in a leasehold interest for a period of three years with two additional single year extensions the entire first floor with the ability to use the patio as well as the verandas um, for the use of the restaurant initially starting with the main rooms at the restaurant in their staff report we provide uh, the t basic financial terms were provided in the first six months of, with no base rent to help them get up to speed. You know, when you open up a restaurant, especially when you move 15 miles away from your original location, you, you might bring some of your clientele, but you gotta have an opportunity to get that critical mass of individuals to come. So they need to be able to start making money and stay viable. And then starting at month seven and progressively as we go higher, the rent will continue to increase and the uh, restaurant will be covering the first floor utilities which include a separate electrical meter which services that first floor as well as a, per, a proportionate share of the rest of the utilities on that first floor. Uh, so we're very excited. Uh, the price point of the restaurant is something that uh, is very conducive to residents within our city. The geographic region around our city when you compare it amongst Covina and determine based on economic data, uh, median incomes, number of residents and how much those residents typically spend on food there's, it's a much higher amount. It's on average about $500 a year more per person in our area than it would be in Covina. So it's a much more economically viable area in this location. And so I asked to have that authorization enter into that lease. The expectation is for them to take possession and enter in effective May 1st of this year. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, any, any questions? Ryan, you have any questions? No, thank you. All right, I'll entertain a motion. I sure will. I'll, I'll I think this is great that we're we're doing this, and um, I will move that we authorize the city manager to execute the agreement as he outlined in his report. I second it. Right now. Do I have a second? I, I second the motion. Thank you. There's a heck of a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? Mr. Mayor, I have some comments. Uh, go ahead before we call for a vote. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say for members of the public uh, that have followed this, this was a long process. Uh, I'm going to support the motion, uh, but not without some reservation. I do have concerns about putting another restaurant similar to Angela's or Pizzetto's in that location. I am also concerned about the viability long term as it relates to this, but those that have followed this particular topic, uh, you know, know there is a lot of community support to be able to see another restaurant go in there. And so I do hope that uh, Vincenzo's is successful. And I think that the council uh, and the city staff collectively have worked diligently to be able to set them up for success as we move forward into this agreement. But I also ask that the community does their part to ensure that this place is also successful as well as all of our other businesses, because it really does take us investing locally to be able to see businesses like this thrive. So uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the time. Thank you. Chris? And just one add, uh, Councilmember Vienna triggered something else that's in the staff report. We engaged the third party to do a financial due diligence of the restaurant. And so that third party is a broker who evaluated their financial capacity both before and during the pandemic. They did not lay off a single employee uh, due to economics. During the course of that time, they did receive a uh, payment protection plan grant that they were in compliance with. Um, the vendors, they were on time and paying their vendors. They weren't behind, they weren't behind on payroll. And so the recommendation of their broker was they're a good long-term investment opportunity uh, from their financial perspective. All right, thank you. Okay, any further questions? We have a, f a first and a s we have a first and a second. All in favor? We have to do a roll call. Mayor Badar? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ebner? Aye. Councilmember Nakano? Aye. Councilmember Vienna? Yes. Councilmember Weber? Yes. <laughs> All right. Break out the champagne. That's okay. been a long time coming. <laughs> it's a 5-0 vote. Uh, motion carries. Welcome to Vincenzo's, and uh, we'll see what happens May 1st. Okay. 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 We're going to move into oral. We're going to move into oral communications. Yeah. Moving on into. Oral communications, members of the audience, speakers are limited to three minutes or as may be determined by the chair. That's, that's you. Oh, by me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone wishing to speak to the council? Any, any cards, Madam Chair? Uh, just very quickly, since there don't seem to be any cards, I'm Mr. Milburn, government teacher, St. Amos High School. Just want to say how proud I am of my students tonight. They're doing a great job choosing to take an active role in the discussion here, asking great and wonderful questions, insightful ones, asking uh, questions the city staff needs to be aware of and to be thinking about. So good job, folks. Appreciate proud of you, as always. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to uh, speak to the council at this time? Okay. We're going to go into staff reports. Pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. It's all right. Again, I just wanted to do a quick thanks. I um, I was grateful to have this opportunity presented to be able to actually participate in a meeting such as this. I was very worried this morning when I woke up and um, had caught my mother's cold, but I have taken lots of medicine and drank a cup of tea. So I'm very happy that I was able to feel well enough to come and participate in this. And overall, I feel that this has been very insightful, very intriguing to see how this entire process works. And I'm excitedly looking forward to tomorrow's day of events and everything that will be happening. That's Thank all. you. Thank you. When we're going to go through uh, uh, staff reports, uh, like uh, city manager, city attorney, and uh, as I call those those positions, uh, if your, you know, if your uh, future boss wants to speak, please f allow them to say whatever they want to say. All right. So, city manager. 
Chris, do you have anything you want to add? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's uh, just one item. Uh, the Gold Line will be conducting a full road closure overnight and through the weekend at on Cataract, south of Arrow Highway at the MetroLink lines. They're going to be doing asphalt work around their public right of way on both sides. And so that will connect the remaining portion of Covina, which is the roadway we have done over the last year and completes that project. And so expect that to be closed through April 16th. All right, thank you, city attorney. <clears throat> Mayor, every year on Student and Government Day, I like to give a little bit of a story or an overview of an issue that's happening in the world of municipal law and the legal battles that cities get themselves into. This year I'm going to try to be brief because of the hour. But um, last year it was the battle between the state of California and cities over housing. Um, and this year that is going to be the exact same topic because the battle is still, is still going. Um, as everyone in the room probably knows, uh, the state has the position that California has an extreme housing shortage and that we need to produce a lot more housing in this state than that we have been producing over the past uh, decades in order to meet our population growth. Cities uh, traditionally have had the ability to zone. We, we can legally take areas of our town and we can enact zoning ordinances that um, regulate what type of development can be built in those in each zone. So for example, we have single family home zoning. And in single family homes, home zoning areas, the only thing that can be built is a single family house on a lot, one single family house on a lot. Over the past couple of years now, the state has take an aim at those kind of zoning ordinances because the state feels that that is restricting the amount of housing that can be built in the state. So one of the things the state has done is to encourage more housing. It has required cities to allow not just one house to be built in single family zone, uh, single family home zoning areas, but up to four. So in every um, in every city in the state, in every parcel that's on a single-family home zoning, the state is saying the city has to allow not just one, but up to four houses now um, that can be done by splitting the lot into two and then building two houses on each one of the two lots. And you can imagine the effect that that kind of densification can have on the neighborhoods in in town. If you have a street full of single family homes, one on each lot, and that turns into a street full of four homes on each lot, that can cause issues with parking, it can cause issues with um, the capacity of utilities to serve all of those new units. So um, cities are doing a, a variety of things in order to try to uh, regain or maintain their local control uh, in zoning regulation and to push back against the state and the state mandates about this. Last year I talked about a city in Northern California that had taken an extreme position. Uh, this year I am going to talk about Huntington Beach, which is the city where I uh, partially grew up and went to high school. But Huntington Beach uh, is taking the position that they are banning all uh, lot splits. They are banning all second units on um, single family home zoned lots. And so essentially in Huntington Beach, the city is saying they're not going to comply with the new state laws that require uh, more housing in single family home zones. The state of California um, decided to sue Huntington Beach about that. And um, the lawsuit went on for a while. Huntington Beach decided that it would relent just a few days ago, and it has repealed its ordinances. They're banning um, the laws that Huntington Beach adopted. It so it relented and it repealed them. Um, there's still a few claims left in the lawsuit. One of them is this: the housing element sites that we talked about earlier in the meeting. Huntington Beach is refusing to rezone um, sites in their city 
to meet the state's required uh, housing, number of housing units. Uh, so the state is also suing Huntington Beach about that. Uh, if the state prevails, there are a number of penalties that can be imposed on the city, including the city could lose its ability to regulate and deny any housing development. So any housing developer could come and apply to the city to build anything they want, and the city would have to approve it. That's the kind of danger that you can get into if um, the state sues you about things like this and you lose. So here in San Dimas, we are, uh, the council has, uh, in my opinion, taken a more reasoned and responsible approach in um, adopting reasonable regulations on lot splits and second unit ADUs that we feel are, can be legally defended in court. Um, but there are some cities out there, and Huntington Beach is just the latest one, that has taken a more extreme position in trying to protect their local zoning, and the state is coming down hard on those kind of cities. It's been in the news uh, a lot recently, this lawsuit between the state and Huntington Beach, and the governor has held press conferences about it to try to um, discourage other cities from taking that path. So uh, these are the kind of things that I advise the city about. We just had a meeting on this at the last council meeting about what kind of regulations the city would adopt on lot splits under this new state law. And um, maybe next year we will be talking about another battle between the state and cities on housing, or maybe it might be a different topic. But um, that's a little insight into the work that city attorneys do for cities and what I do for San Dimas. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Young lady, you have something you'd like to say? Ditto. <laughs> All right. All right, members of the city council, I'm gonna go ahead and call on Ryan because he needs to get to bed if you're, if you're still out there, Ryan. Ryan? Thank you. Uh, I have uh, nothing, no expenses to report uh, at the expense of the local agency and as it relates to any updates or anything like that, uh, I appreciate uh, the staff uh, working to uh, let me be able to uh, uh, remote in today under the uh, provisions of the old Brown Act. Uh, I, uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. area for uh, my day job and uh, arrived late yesterday and the time change is quite fun and try to sneak in a nap so I can make this council meeting. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to see the uh, matter related to Vincenzo's move forward and I agree with council member Ebner's comments. There was a lot of time, effort, and energy spent into researching that and the staff. And uh, I think everyone did a wonderful job in seeing that come to fruition. And lastly, uh, to the students, thank you for being there. Thank you, Trist, uh, in local government. Uh, it is something that is very rewarding. It is one of it, the form of, uh, as I say, year that absolutely touches your life in every which way from the sidewalks you walk on to the roads you travel uh, to the recreation and open space areas that you enjoy in our community having grown up here it is a great community and one day i hope that you will sit in one of the seats that we occupy uh, and move our city forward and love it as much as we do uh, and turn your love into action whether that's being a city attorney that's being an elected official a uh, sheriff's deputy uh, or beyond. Uh, there's so many ways to get involved. Uh, city management, uh, planning. Uh, there's just so many great, wonderful opportunities that there's not enough people going into government jobs. And so uh, I do uh, hope uh, as someone who works uh, in government and public safety, uh, we do need people like you to go into government service and if it is something that you feel a call calling for, uh, I encourage you to do that. And uh, while I'm not in the city now, if uh, you would like to meet further discuss that, I'd be happy to do that at some point. Thank you so much and have a good night. 
Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. And Councilwoman reports on meetings attended at the expense of the local agency. Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, Councilman uh, John Ebner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, uh, thanks, Ryan, for joining us from so far away. That was good to hear your voice. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, kind of piggyback on what Jeff was saying. He's a great city attorney, and um, he keeps us on the straight and narrow. And, you know, we don't always – there, there's probably faster ways to get things done. And, and uh, you know, every now and then we want to sue the state or somebody else. And Jeff says, well, you know, that might cost you a million dollars. And, you know, so we usually take his advice. So, uh, yeah, so he's, he's a real – it's a great position and a, and a great field to go in. I would say. I have uh, actually just two things, and they both, I'd like to have uh, resolutions on the next uh, meeting uh, proc uh, doing a proclamation. So the first is a resolution proclaiming April as Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. This is a, uh, there's a statewide thing passed. Uh, the first one was in 2019, and many cities. Um, have a resolution to that effect. So that's the first thing I'd like to do. I just need one, one other person to uh, support me on that. Second. I second. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, the other one is uh, also in the next meeting, I hope, uh, is a resolution proclaiming April 23rd to 29th as Crime Victims Rights Week. This was originally proclaimed by President Reagan in 1981, and um, we don't have it on our rotation of proclamations, so I think it's a good one to do. Anybody want to support that one? I'll support it. And I've supplied samples of these resolutions to Chris, um, and he or somebody else will put them together, but I, I really appreciate that. And lastly, uh, I do want to thank all the students who have, have chosen to be here tonight, and my counterpart, Isabella Trejos. Um, great questions, and uh, oh yeah. I'd love that. Uh, but uh, thanks, for, thanks for showing up. And um, this was one of our, our milder meetings. We didn't get into the housing laws or, or some project that uh, we could have a great debate on and disagree and vote different ways. But, um, but yeah, you get a little bit of insight. And I will see, uh, see you at tomorrow's lunch. But uh, thanks so much. And then I'd like to pass it over to Ms. Trejos. If you, do you have anything else to say? You don't have to. Well, I'll just say thank you for this opportunity, and I've had a really good time, and it's been very insightful. Thank you. As I ask uh, this, the uh, students prior to this meeting in the, uh, in the conference room when we first met, uh, I want to allow any of the student who has something that they would like to say the opportunity they're, don't, they're not just sitting up here. We have four or five that are sitting out in the audience there. So I wanted to ask, you know, you know Scott's uh, student if she'd like to say something. I just want to say that I'm super grateful. Um, I've never really have been into like getting involved with my local community until very recently. So being here has just been very insightful and um, my family has just been starting to try to get more involved in local community events. And I think it's so important just for connection. And um, I just really commend you guys for what you do because I feel like it's very overlooked and so I very much appreciate it, and thank you for giving us this opportunity as students to experience this and really realize the importance of what you guys do. So thank you. Yeah. Michael, your students already spoke, but do you have anything else you'd like to say? I mostly just wanted to say one more thing about all of the events that go on in this community and how amazing it is. Um, as somebody whose family is very self-reliant, we aren't able to go out into the community as much because 
that we have such a busy home life. I live on one of those split lots. So like our address is the one and then right next to us is the one and a half, basically. Luckily recently, my maternal grandparents actually moved in. So we're super close to family and it's great, but all of us rely on each other a lot. And so we don't go out into the community and support as much. So it's really amazing for me as like a teen in San Dimas previously and now as a young adult in San Dimas to go out and see these community events. I went to the farmer's market last week. I will be going tomorrow. It's one of my favorite events that happens in this city. I go as often as I can and it's really amazing to see those and then events that students can participate in um, like the choir at the Christmas event and going and caroling around is always really memorable. So. I would just really like to express my gratitude for those community events and for those opportunities for even just one person to go out and have a good time rather than feeling like they need a group to go somewhere. Like you, you never go, you don't really go to a restaurant alone. It always feels really awkward to just go by yourself and like sit up at the bar. But for an event like the farmer's market or that Christmas event, you can go by yourself and still have a good time. So I really appreciate those city events and I appreciate all of you for facilitating them. Thank you. Henry? Hello, I'm Jared Marcelino. Uh, I just want to thank you for this experience. I'm not really involved in any uh, community events, and I've never experienced anything like this before. And I'm interested, so I'll try to be more involved uh, tomorrow and in the future. And I just uh, thanks for taking care of our community. Um, Thanks for trying to help make more homes and uh, taking care of the the waste management and all that. And um, thanks for this experience. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry? Hi, I'm Nathan. I just wanted to say thank you and that I appreciate all the thought and care that goes into city planning and all the little details that we might not think about, like trash and stuff. But th thank you so much for making sure that we're all taken care of and we're like cared for as a community. Thank you. Yeah, as soon as, as soon as your parents start getting one of those bills, you'll become a little more, a little more interested. Okay, ladies, you had a chance to speak. Do you have anything else you'd like to say? Um, yes, uh, I just wanted to say like before coming to this, I definitely did not have any idea what this would be like. And honestly, I kind of assumed that it'd be kind of like an isolated event where everyone just spoke very coldly to each other. But now being here and being able to experience it firsthand, I really see like everyone just really cooperates with each other and just like, it's almost like, a San Dimas family and like honestly being a volunteer at San Dimas Farmers Market and being able to see this firsthand and how they kind of work one in one with each other and how Isabella Trejos for example was able to like propose things to also be initiated into the San Dimas Farmers Market was really interesting to me so thank you. Brad? <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Mark Cooley. I'd just like to thank you guys for everything you do. Thank you for the experience. I forgot the third thing I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys. Same as high school football rules. <laughs> Have I missed anybody out there? Eric Nakano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before I begin uh, my remarks, I wanted to turn to Council Member Ruark and see if she had anything she would like to share with the council and with the audience. Uh, just thank you for everything you do. It's getting late, so I don't want to say much. 
Thank you. <laughs> that was a uh, crowd-pleasing line, I, I see. <laughs> Um, I will, uh, I'll be brief, Mr. Merrill, though there are a few things I wanted to raise. So the first is, is that um, Anthony Porter had uh, asked if we would consider sponsoring um, the Ed Jones Golf Tournament. So I'd like to add that to the agenda uh, for next meeting to discuss and approve. So with that, is there a second who would support adding that to the agenda? No second. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to send my regards to Councilman Vienna. Thank you very much for joining us. You are missed here, and we hope you're doing well over in Washington, D.C. We wish you a speedy trip back, uh, and we, we hope that you're able to enjoy Washington, D.C. Uh, while you're there. It's, it's the Cherry Blossom Festival time period, so lots to do there. Um, and, uh, and we look forward to your return. The other thing I wanted to say is to the students, thanks so much for participating. Uh, my, I grew up in St. Amos myself, uh, was born actually at St. Amos Hospital, attended Gladstone Elementary and Lone Hill Middle School. Um, and this is my home. I left for a time and returned and I wanted to give back to the community. And I hope as you're sitting there, you see how important it is for you yourselves to get involved. Uh, we heard so many great suggestions tonight, so many great ideas. Uh, it's really clear that you have a vision for what our city could be, especially as we're talking about our downtown specific plan and others. And your voice at the table is certainly welcome. When you look at that wall right over there. I especially want the women in this room to look over there since the majority, I think, of participants are women. We've only ever had one woman ever serve on city council. I'm actually the first person of color ever to serve on city council. So I hope that as you think about what kind of voice you could bring, what kind of perspective you could bring, um, it's not tomorrow, it's actually today. And, uh, and with the wisdom and the energy and the insights that you brought tonight, I hope that you will continue that uh, in the days, years to come, even if you're away at college, there's always a place for you. This is your home and will always be your home, and we hope that you return uh, and make your community better. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is that, oh, one other thing for the city, uh, for the students, is that I'm surprised, Margie, you, you didn't give your, your normal spiel about your walk. A great way to get to know the city in downtown is the, is the Historical Society does this great walk. Uh, sometimes the former mayor actually leads the talks on it. Uh, but if you want to take a, a quick tour on a Saturday morning, they do it monthly. Um, talk to Margie, who is the president of our historical society and can get you hooked up uh, and to learn more about what goes on in downtown and the, the history, the great history of our city. Um, I wanted to let the council know, the, the audience know that uh, like Many of us, we have day jobs, and so I'll be uh, out of the country for our next meeting, so we'll not be here, uh, but we'll be um, uh, probably not tuning in given the time difference, but I look forward to catching updates uh, as to how things go at the next meeting. Uh, but you will see this chair empty. Perhaps you'll come and sit in my place, Councilman Rourke. Um, and then one other thing I did want to bring up, and I know that this may induce some snickering, but I believe uh, and it strongly is that April uh, is the month of 420, and I know that 420 cannabis has quite a bit of um, connotations around it, but the way that it touched me, as many of you know, that my mother passed away from cancer, uh, and cannabis was one of the few things that actually helped with her chemotherapy, with her nausea, and with her illness. And so, well, uh, well 420 is a major holiday for those who are users, and I used to work in the industry. I also just want to take the moment uh, to call out that for many people, cannabis also is a medical, um, is a medicine, and it, it, it had made a huge difference in, in my family's life uh, and being able to manage nausea, pain, et cetera. And it's something that um, as, as we approach 420 and, and people see the, all the events, you also recognize that there's an important medical component to it as well, and people depend on that uh, for, their, um, for their life. Uh, so that's it. Thanks so much again for attending, for participating. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor, unless Councilman Rourke has anything else you would like to say. I did actually want to add to that. Um, I also have similar experiences with uh, marijuana in my family. My dad suffered from Crohn's disease before he passed, and marijuana helped him a lot with that pain. And I very much agree with what you said, and I'm very happy you said it. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Eric. 
I think you're in the hot seat now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just want to say uh, just th this opportunity is just, uh, I personally don't get involved much um, except for music and band, but just being here in this house with all of you guys is just, it, it opens this window of possibility on what it's like, what how the huge clock of government works. It's just so fascinating and so interesting to see all the details and just how it all works and meshes together it it's just i just don't know how else to describe it i i enjoy and i find it fascinating the topics that this council gets into and i love the ideas and um i it, it just fascinates me so much i i've just loved this like concept of government and how it works and just it, it evolves that's the cool part about it is that it evolves through each generation and i um, like just thank you all for giving us this opportunity to see what happens like just thank you and to think at the beginning of this whole thing he said i don't want that microphone thing <laughs> uh, <laughs> um the only thing that I have to add uh, is that uh, I, I think I'd like to underscore to everybody in attendance here from, from um, the high school that um, us as a council, we're only as good as our city staff. And uh, from the city attorney to every one of our directors and, uh, and our managers, uh, they do a fantastic job. And without them, uh, we're just five normal guys that sit up here and we would nothing would get done if it was just up to us so um i, I just want to highlight uh their hard work that uh that m i would say 99.9 .9 percent of the work that gets done is done by city staff so uh they they work extremely hard and uh we just sit up here and tell them what to do and uh you know that that's the easy part um so they do a fantastic job. And then uh, to, to comment on uh, people who, who get involved in, in their communities, um, I think that local politics and uh, getting involved in your community is unique uh, and, and unlike anything else because uh, if, you, if you were to get involved on a state level, even a county level, uh, and certainly the federal level, um, many of your efforts aren't as visible as as they would be if you focused on your community everything that you you invest in your own community is almost immediately visible um and uh and i, I think you know that that was a big eye-opener for me as i started getting involved in uh, in the city of san dimas and uh and you know just being a part of the community uh, as a whole um it, that's that's the one thing that really stuck out was that Every little thing that you do, there's an immediate payback, and you can see what it is that you've accomplished and what it is that you've done, and that's extremely rewarding. And it's, like I said, unlike any other um, involvement that you may have uh, at any other level of government. Um, and then I would like to say uh, thank you all for being here. I think this is a really important program, and I hope it was really insightful. And, and the, the last thing that I want to thank you for is thank you for uh, being here because... Uh, this meeting didn't go till 2.30 in the morning like they sometimes do. And that is a win for us as it is for you guys too. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Um, I'm fortunate enough to participate in something similar like this as class president of my school or of my grade. And um, I think seeing it on a real life level where you don't talk about things like prom ticket sales and you're talking about housing and how it's affecting residents of San Dimas. I think that's really cool to see it in that light. And I think it's uh, gravitating for me to hear and to experience. So I wanna say thank you to all the council members and city members, and also to Mr. Milbrandt out there for organizing this and allowing us to participate in something as cool and awesome like this. And also, do we get to, can we keep the trash cans? <laughs> Ooh, let's go. <laughs> thank you. All right, I, I have a, a, a few things. I was fortunate to talk with Cora, and uh, we talked about her college expectations, and she's going to stay local. But um, uh, I think that's a good thing for the community because, if, as you just heard, uh, she's, she's a very involved uh, young student here, and I think that 
We're very fortunate. Cora, thank you very much. Thank you. Just to, to, to go through a couple of things for people who frequent and hear us more and more often. This book <laughs> right here, I want to thank you because this agenda package is actually 2,818 pages. 2,818 pages of which we picked up on Friday and we're supposed to read and digest by tonight. So it's just so you're aware that it's not always this thin. And it's, in fact, it's never this thin, okay? And then when we go into, it's getting late and then the hour is 9.25 or 9.30 or whatever time it is. Eric was absolutely right. Some of these meetings go to 11, 12, 1, 2, 3 in the morning. It's been a while since we got to 3, but they have been there. But uh, normally we don't get out of here till 10, 30, 11 o'clock, maybe a little later if we have a special session or something like that. Um, one thing that brought to mind when, when the city attorney was talking about the state of California and and how they're doing the housing element and everything. I just, within the last couple of days, happened to be watching a cable television network that mentioned the fact that over, over uh, 500,000 Californians this last year had exited the, the state of California. That means they're moving. There's a reason why they're moving. And I don't know what the reasons are, I have my own visions, but there's a lot of people uh, that are looking for other places in the, in the, in the world to live. Uh, you know, housing could be definitely be a part of it. Uh, financial portions could be a part of it, but there's, there is a lot going on and people are moving. And uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, San Dimas is a drawing card to bring people back. Okay, and we talk about participation. We all talk about it and stuff like that. I just want to say, I like this event because I get a chance to talk with students of, you know, that you guys are just plain everyday students. You're doing a great job. You're getting your education and everything. And this is really for your teacher advisor, okay? About Eight, ten years ago, I think John will probably remember, we had one of these, these uh, meetings like this where the st students came, we did our day in government, and we mentioned the fact that we would like to see what your government does at your school. And the next year, we were invited to participate in one of your student council meetings at, at your school we didn't have a bad lunch. It was pretty good. Uh, I, I just think that th this is a flip-flop thing. Well, you know what? I, I think that most of the council would like to and look forward to going and visiting with you guys. So I've said it a couple of times. I don't think the right guys are hearing it, but I'm hoping that you guys are hearing it. Okay? So that, that, that's, that, that's where it's at. The other side of this thing is I had a great mayor sitting next to me. She's so sharp that I gave her an option that said, hey, you're the mayor. You can say whatever you want to say and say, this is no homework Tuesday. But I didn't hear those words come out of her mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess you're going to go home and do homework. <laughs> okay? Um, that's it. We have no, no further uh, study sessions or closed sessions tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate being a part of, of San Dimas High School. And uh, good night. <laughs>